uh, finish up Nahum this morning, so that'll be good. Only and then we're supposed to be looking at the doctrine of the Bible, but I said January we were going to start looking at that. We're just a little late, but um, we'll start it up here pretty quick. Let's pray and then let's uh, sing together number 233, Heaven Came Down and Glory Filled My Soul. Just wanted to sing this one this morning. That's the one that we sang when we began looking at Nahum. So we'll just end on the same note that we began. So, uh, Father, we thank you again for uh, this morning. Lord, I thank you for the sunshine that we see outside and reminded that you are our Savior and that you came and you died for us and you've given us eternal life. Lord, I thank you so much for that, that we can uh, place our sins and we can confess, Lord, before you and be forgiven. Thank you for all that you've done for us. We pray for our Sunday school hour here, Lord. We ask that you be with uh, Shannon and Wyatt in their class too and the things, Lord, that are discussed here, Lord. And uh, prepare us also, Lord, for the uh, gathering of the saints after this, Lord. And we want to pray for those folks that would be coming, Lord. We pray that they would come this morning, that the coldness outside wouldn't prevent them, but they would be here and fellowship with us, Lord. We give you this uh, time in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. Heaven came down, 233. See Brother Kurt will lead us. favorite part of that this morning was, and the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came. Isn't that quick? The Lord changes our hearts when we come right to Him. Praise the Lord for that. I wish that the people here that we've been looking at in Nahum would have come to that point uh, and believed in the Lord too before the destruction and God's wrath was poured out upon them. Um, well, let's... Uh, Take our Bibles, and we are in chapter 3. We're going to try and complete this this morning, so we'll move quickly through here. Um, last week, though, we uh, looked at verse 8. Are thou better than populous no, that was situate among the rivers, that had the waters round about it, whose rampart was the sea, 
and her wall was from the sea. Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was infinite. Put and Lubin were thy helpers. Yet was she carried away. She went into captivity. Her young children also were, cla were dashed in pieces at the top of all the streets. And they cast lots for her honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. So we looked at a little picture of No last week in that a great city there uh, that the Assyrian Empire took over, and Nahum's telling them, don't forget, don't forget what you guys did to that one city there that looked like nobody could get in, surrounded by a whole bunch of people, surrounded by waters, but you were able to get in and you were able to take it over, and now the hands are changing. God's judgment is coming to you. Verse 11, we go on and says, he takes us back to uh, Nineveh again. Thou also shall be drunken. Thou shall be hid. Thou also shall seek strength because of the enemy. And I think maybe some of the things that were going on here is the catastroph catastrophic event hits them. The Tigris River overflows. The walls begin to come down and Babylon's able to make entrance into the city. And I think many of these people, many of the men resorted to hiding themselves, it says. And all thy strongholds shall, oh, uh, verse 11, thou shalt be drunken and thou shalt be hid. Thou also shalt seek strength because of the enemy. As the enemy comes in, they're trying to just gather up the last little bit of strength maybe that they can have and maybe some of that, uh, what do you call it when people drink and they get courageous, right? Some people resort to alcohol to kind of have some courage, maybe courage to meet other people, maybe courage to do other things. I think that's what they do for a time is they resort and they hide and they go and they drink. They're trying to muster up just a little bit more courage to go out against these Babylonians that have entered in. And I think, isn't that what people, isn't that what people do in our day when events happen in their lives? Catastrophic events, death, whatever it might be. Many people run to the bottle, don't they? They run to alcohol to try and grab some courage, maybe some strength, maybe something to help them through, to help them on in what they're enduring. And that's a little bit what it looks like here that Nineveh does. Trying to grasp just a little bit more strength. But I think there's also another application, not only them seeking out and being drunken and trying to grab a hold of wine and all those things. But I also can't help but think that they're going to be drunk. They're going to be drunk with the wrath of the Almighty God. God's coming. And His wrath is going to be poured out upon them. And it's going to consume them. Consume them. It's going to be poured out upon them. Not drunk with real wine, you want to say there, but drunk with God's wrath poured out upon them. And then we go to the next verse, and it says, All thy strongholds shall be like fig trees, with the first ripe figs. If they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. And I haven't been around fig trees very much. I don't know a lot about fig trees, so I read a little bit about fig trees to try and gain a, maybe a little bit of knowledge, but it, it sounds like when a fig tree is ripe and it's ready for the picking or it's ready for the eating, if you go to that fig tree and you just cast a little shake to it, the figs will fall off. They're that ready, they're that ripe, and this city is the same way. They're ripe for God's wrath, aren't they? They're just right there. It's almost going to fall down. It's almost going to come down. It's going to crash all around them. And the eater is going to be the Babylonians. 
All thy strongholds shall be like fig trees. All those little places in this city that maybe you are keeping another little stronghold. If they get right to here, maybe we have just enough to take the enemy when they come. Oh, and then this stronghold over here. Well, I think it's a little different. Uh, Lee might remember this a little bit. When we, when we did dynamic entry into buildings and law enforcement, maybe we were serving a warrant and it was a no-knock warrant and we needed to get in there and, and drug dealers a lot of times have what? Guns, don't they? They got guns for protecting themselves. So what we wanted to do in our work is we wanted to dominate the building or dominate the house before anybody knew what was going on. So that means you might take a, a team in the main floor and you might put another team in the basement floor. But the thing was is that you took the house all at the same time. And what you wanted to do is before anybody knew what was going on, you had control of every room in the house. They had no opportunity to gain a weapon or to do anything to be able to hurt you. I think that same, as I'm thinking all these strongholds, I was thinking of strongholds within those houses when we would go in dynamically like that and do that, that that's kind of what the Babylonians are going to do right here in this city, Nineveh. Even though there's strongholds and rooms everywhere, when they hit the place, they're going to hit it, I think, simultaneously. And it's going to be just like that fig tree as you shake it a little bit. All the figs, all those stronghold areas are going to be taken just like that. That's what God is going to do to Nineveh. And then as we go on to the next verse, what else do we see a little bit more? Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. The gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. Why would it say all of a sudden the women right here? Normally in that day, in that time, who were the people that were on the front lines? They were the men. The men were the ones that were the military. So as the uh, Babylonians were going to come in, the great men of Nineveh were the men that were going to take over. They're the Assyrian Empire that took over many of these other nations. There they are. But I think it's a picture of when they've entered in. They've captured all the strongholds. They've knocked down all the figs. They've taken all the men who's left in the midst of the city. But the women... And you know, what will women do when brought to the point? When the men aren't around anymore, they've been captured and taken, are the women going to fight? The women are going to fight, aren't they? Here the women come out of their corners and wherever they are, they're going to fight. They're going to maintain and hold the city. And if you think of the ladies, they weren't prepared for the military. They hadn't had the training, but they were still going to fight. And I even think of maybe a little bit more. I think there were some of those men that when the Babylonians came in, they were afraid. The wine didn't do what it should have done for them. It didn't give them the courage that they needed. They were hiding. They were afraid, but the ladies were stepping up and they were going to take. And you know, I think, of, I think of my wife with that because I'm kind of a sissy. When it, comes, when it comes to pain, when it comes to hurt, I'm the first. I, uh, and I think that's these men, they could see the pain. Maybe they were under pain, but it took them into hiding. But the women can take more, it seems like. They can take more pain. More, in, they can endure more. So who's there still fighting? The ladies of the city are right there bringing it on, aren't they? Bring it on, unprepared. But even though the ladies had that heart there, they weren't going to be able to stand against the hand of Almighty God as He run through with the Babylonians. And then draw, verse 14, draw the waters for the siege. Fortify thy strongholds. Go into clay and tread the mortar. 
Make strong the brick kiln. Part of the walls are falling down from the Tigris River. Oh, they're working frantically, aren't they? To try and build up those walls again, to kind of prevent the enemy from penetrating. I, I kind of think of uh, a flood. We know if we've seen on the news a little bit, if you're in a flood plain, or maybe it's, what was it, New Orleans not too long ago, what they've done now, if they've built up around, haven't they? So if they endure something like that again, was it what hurricane was it? What was it? Katrina. If they have something like that again, they've built the dikes, they've built everything up higher to try and withstand. I remember in Grand Forks, Shelly and I went there to visit my uncle. The, uh, is it the Red River? It's the Red River or something, I think. It goes through the Red River Valley. And oh, that, that uh, if you haven't been up to Fargo, that area, the dirt up there. Who's been there? Who's been through there? That dirt is black, isn't it? I mean, something like you've never seen in that Red River Valley. Well, it's been probably maybe 15 to 17 years ago, maybe, that that Red River overflew, overflowed right there. And my uncle told stories about it. He was a truck driver and dispatched trucks, but they were taking trucks, semi-trucks, and those sandbags and stuff, and they were trying to save the city. They were. It was going to be flooded, and they're putting sandbags all over there. And even particularly where my uncle's house was, it looked like it wasn't far from the Red River. It was going to be flooded. And they're working their best. But you know, and Shelly and I were there. Uh, they took us to the area where all the houses were that had been flooded there. And it, it, there was no houses on any. There were some little foundation pieces that were left, but there was no houses or anything. There was a few trees and stuff that were around there. But they worked. You can see these Ninevites, or the Nineveh people of Nineveh, working hard and strong to try and keep the floodwaters, to try and prevent the penetration, but they could work as they, with all their might, with all the power and strength that they had. But the God of heaven was coming through, and he was going to take the city. 15 says, there shall the fire devour thee, the sword shall cut thee off. It shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Make thyself many as the canker worm. Make thyself many as the locust. The next verse says, Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of the heaven. The canker worm spoileth and flieth away. And it gives us two illustrations here. It gives us an illustration of the Babylonians as a canker worm. But it also gives us an illustration of Nineveh as a canker worm. And you know, it uses canker worm and then it uses locusts. They're, they're really the same. You know, when I first thought, heard a canker worm, I thought, well, it's like a, a worm, you know, that comes in to some place that, you know, like trees and takes them over. But the canker worm, what it is, and locusts, they mean a couple different things. Canker worm means the licking up locusts. The licking up locusts. And the locust means swarming. The swarming locust. So if they talk about canker worm, that's the part they're saying they're going to come in and lick up everything that's around. We know when the locusts come in and they take a field. I remember watching, a, it seemed like it was a movie. Maybe it was... A, I'm trying to think of what it was. It's been a long time. Like Hildalgo. Hild I think it was Hild Hildalgo, and if that was what it was called, where it actually gave you a little picture of a swarm of locusts, you know, a little bit bigger than our, what our grasshoppers would be. But when it would come in the sky, it just became dark. I mean, you couldn't really even tell what it was until it got a little closer to you. That's the swarming. That's the swarming. And then it goes from the swarming to the canker worm when they actually come upon the fields. You don't see the swarm anymore, but they're all over the fields. And what do they do? They look up every last bit of food that there is. They say, canker worm's coming. Babylon's coming. When they come in, they're going to lick you up completely. Even ladies, even though you stood up, which is a good honoring thing, I'm going to take everything 
out. And it looks like even here it gives us, it shows us the Nineveh, Nineveh people, the Assyrians, they were as the canker worm. They were trying to make themselves many, and they were many as an army. And it says even 16, it says, Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. That's a great vast number, isn't it? Look at how they've multiplied themselves. They're as of a locust, a canker worm coming in, the licking up and the swarming. They've done the same thing, and that's how their military is right now. But there's something that's going to happen. It's not big enough. It's not great enough. Because God's in it. Right? I'm thinking of that song. I don't know. I just, maybe because I said that little as much when God is in it. Verse 17 goes on and says, Thy crown are as the locusts, thy captains as the great grasshoppers which camp in the hedges in the cold day. But when the sun ariseth, they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. Before I hit 17, I want you to see the very last part of 16 that I missed. It says, The canker worm spoileth and flieth away. And that was speaking of Babylon. They were going to come in and spoil, completely ravage the city, and then they were going to be what? Gone. Isn't that what happens with the canker worm when it comes in? It comes in and takes over the whole fields. And when they're done, they move on. They're gone, out of that place, just like very quickly. It doesn't take long. But here we see when they do and they come in here, I think the people, the crowned ones, the captains, these that are great, they're camped now in the hedges in the cold day. But when the sun arises, they flee away and their place is not known where they are. I think of all that great army of the Assyrians, many of them, like we said, when the ladies were standing up, some of them men, the coward, they were cowering and they were hiding. And I'm thinking of the coolness. You know, as night falls and you think of the locusts, when it gets cold out, they move a little slower. They probably can't get to flight like they ought to get to flight and get out. So what they're going to do is they're going to stay in the hedges until the morning hour when the sun rises and it comes up and begins to heat them up. And then what are they going to do? They're going to move on out. And I'm thinking of those people, those men of Assyria here, as Babylon's come in, they've been hiding and they're in, in the cold and, and there's a defeat that's there. But you know what they want? They wanna, they're waiting to conjure up just enough energy. That heat, when that sun comes up, I'm going to have just enough energy. I want to get just enough energy, and it's not to fight, is it? I'm going to have just enough energy to flee. I'm going to flee, and I'm going to run, and I'm going to hide. And where they go, their place will not be known. They flee away, and their place is not known where they are. And then thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria, Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. They, thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. There is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the brute of thee shall clap. That's the report of thee. Shall clap the hands over thee, for upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually. The shepherds slumber in death. Nobody to lead them anymore. Nineveh has suffered a mortal wound. One that they will not be able to recover from. One that they never recovered from. We already talked about the grave was there. Nobody was going to attend the funeral. But what do they do? All the other nations clap their hands, don't they? They rejoice. There was no sadness over this funeral. They love that Nineveh 
has been taken. And look at what they did. For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually. When we started this last section, we said that Nahum gives the cause for Nineveh's destruction. We looked that it was from within inside, wasn't it? It was from who they were inside that all that came out. They were thieves and they were robbers, whoremongers, and the list goes on of what they were inside and what they were out. But we also said that we were going to see how Nahum justifies God's destruction of the city. And I think we see that in the very last part. The very last part here says, For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? You see, I think even Nahum was rejoicing being one of those other nations over the fall of Nineveh. Rejoicing over the wrath that was coming upon them because of their wickedness continually. You see, we have to see the love of God, don't we? We have to know and respect the love of God. But Nahum here also recognized that our God, his God, is a God of wrath. But in that, he was fair because he didn't desire anybody in Nineveh to fall like that. He wanted them to repent. Remember, they did it for a time and then they walked away from it. But God wanted them to repent. So in our day, in our time, we know that God's wrath is going to be, befall this world. Won't it? And we know those people that haven't come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior are going to be just like Nineveh. Fall. And they're going to die and be separated from God forever. But some people might say that we're maybe morbid, that we will rejoice in that day too. You remember in Revelation, what, what are the people saying? Lord, how long? Oh Lord, how long before you bring your wrath upon the world and the people and finish it up? That cup of God's wrath without mixture is coming. And it's coming. It's coming. But it's all right for us to understand it. And it's all right for us to rejoice in it because when it does come, even though those people will die in their sins, we know the character of our God and that He loved them. And He wanted them to come, but they refused. And that's why they were punished. It's not because our God doesn't love them. It's because they refused to repent. Isn't that what we see in the whole of Revelation there? Even though God's wrath begins to be poured out, they refused to repent. And refuse to repent. I, I try and place myself in that time, and I'm thank, thankful for the Lord that we're not going through it. I believe without a doubt that we're going to be raptured out. But those that go through the tribulation, I would think that that would be enough for me to say, Lord, I believe. But they still refuse to repent and blame God. And blame Him for the events and the things that are happening, but don't recognize it's their sin their sin, and they could come to know the Lord. We need to reach as many people for Jesus in the shortest time possible, don't we? Because His wrath's coming. And I don't know about you, I, I don't want to see people die. I don't want to see people go into eternity without the Lord. But I know because of what the Bible says, it's going to happen. I don't know who they are. But there's people still that we can reach that are coming, that Jesus has. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this book. I thank you for, the, for Nahum, Lord, your prophet here. The things, Lord, that we've learned. We've learned about your character and your greatness here. But we've also learned about your wrath. We've learned about your love, Lord. Many things here. Father, help us just to be able to enter into trust like Nahum did. 
and look to you, Lord, in the circumstances of life. We pray, Lord, that people would come and people would believe, Lord, upon you. Help us to know and reach, Lord, those people that are lost. Help us to reach them for the gospel. Lord, be preparing their hearts for you, Lord. Be with us, Father, this morning as we prepare to worship together here in this place. In all that you would have for us, Lord, we want you to guide us and lead us by the power and the might of your Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that you've given us to be a part of a local body of believers, the corporate church, individually, Lord, what you've made us. It's not been us, Lord. It's been by you. The transaction's complete. And it was quick, and I thank you. We ask this this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.